Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session titled South Island Property Market, Should I Wait? Uh, my name's Rodney King. I'm one of the owners of Loan Market Agile, which is a Christchurch-based loan market mortgage broker franchise. Uh, we've got customers scattered across the country, and we've got a team of nine staff that have the experience and skill to help you with all of your finance needs. Um, now, I need to let you know that what, what you're going to hear today is general advice. It's not personalised advice. Uh, if you would like any further information, feel free to reach out to us uh, so we can take into account your full financial situation. Now, we're going to put up a poll shortly. Uh, we'd appreciate you completing that. It's anonymous uh, as to whether you are looking at buying or selling property in the coming uh, one to two years. Uh, now, it's my pleasure to introduce Cam Bagri uh, to you. Uh, Cameron is one of the leading economists in New Zealand uh, and has over 20 years experience working at Treasury, Statistics New Zealand, and has been chief economist at both National Bank and ANZ Bank. Um, he is now an independent economist, and perhaps most importantly, he's a South Islander at heart, uh, despite living in Wellington, and Cam grew up and studied here in the South Island. So Cam, we're looking for a bit of help from you uh, to answer the question, should I wait? Uh, so I'm gonna start by asking you, uh, please, whether you can share your opinion on what are the key issues that are facing households today? I guess you can look at things through a couple of lenses. Look, obviously, we've got the Reserve Bank out there at the moment has been talking about the house prices being unsustainable. And there's different ways you can assess sustainability. But what I think is more interesting is if you look at the biggest concern out there for households across New Zealand, the net 53% of New Zealand households say housing is a top three concern. Now that is absolutely off the charts in regard to relevance. So before we talk about the Reserve Bank, you know, what we need to acknowledge is that the social conscience of society here really has been tweaked in regard to the property market, affordability, you know, the ability of first home buyers to get onto the property ladder. But normally you see the economy is up there near the top in regard to what are households key concern? You know, the fact that housing and healthcare, inflation, cost of living, what's that one going forward and poverty inequality? Just gives you an idea about, we've got this unequal ledger here between what's called the economic side and the social side. And what we're seeing more and more is that that social side is coming to fruition. And what is it doing? It's becoming pretty influential in regard to what we're seeing in regard to the, the policy priorities. And of course, what we saw was that the Labor and the National Party joined forces a few weeks ago to announce a pretty big policy change in regard to intensification of property within the major cities. Why? Because they need to get more affordable properties into the market, and that means brownfields development as opposed to greenfields development. Okay, great. Thanks um, for that, Kim. That's interesting. So um, just uh, before we carry on, just the poll results. Thanks for those that filled that out. 56% uh, of people are looking to buy or sell, 33% uh, not, and 11% of you are not too sure yet. Um, so that's interesting. So thanks for that. Um, so Kim, thinking about those top issues that you've just touched on, um, and it's hard not to not to agree with those. They feel very relevant for all of us personally. Um, how, do, how does Canterbury and the wider South Island stack up on those metrics, do you think? Well, well if you look at issue number one, particularly yeah, the housing market, yeah, and particularly in regard to affordability. Now, the, one of the biggest constraints in regard to affordable housing is actually the availability of land and the price of land. And what's been happening time and time again, if you have a look at, doesn't matter whether you look at the OECD, Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, or the International Monetary Fund, you know, what do they keep banging on the drum in regard for? Land supply is the key for housing. Now, now if I go back you know, four to five years ago, you know, the, the Canterbury property market was the market across New Zealand that was in pretty good balance. Yeah, why was it in pretty good balance? It's because yeah, there, there was a lot of land supply that was coming on the market. Uh, and, and what have we seen now? Well, yeah, there's still land coming on the market within Canterbury. But of course, yeah, Canterbury valuation-wise got so far out of whack with the rest of New Zealand. You sort of see this truck and this trailer effect. And Auckland sort of like the truck and Canterbury was a sort of trailer. In fact, it was yeah, probably the third trailer. It took an awful long time for sort of, yeah, to pull. And what we've seen now is despite the Canterbury market looking in reasonable equilibrium, 
you know, the, the valuations just become too hard to ignore. So you've seen the Canterbury market, particularly Christchurch, is just springboarded going forward. But yeah, stepping back, you know, land supply is a real key issue. And where we've got continued constraints across New Zealand is in land availability. Uh, but the government is stimulating brownfields development. Yeah, what we actually need is more land for greenfields. And of course, Christchurch, Canterbury, yeah, Selwyn, Waimak, well, there's no shortage of land. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, getting a little bit more expensive now. The locals in uh, Christchurch in particular are, are feeling, feeling the pinch with some out-of-town buyers coming down. And we're certainly seeing um, in our business a lot of North Islanders making that move to the South Island. And in the past, that would have been a trickle from Auckland. Now it's a little bit more than a trickle and it's from um, all parts of the North Island pretty much. So it, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, okay, so Kim, I know you've got a couple of slides here um, to run through with a little bit more in regards to data and perhaps some more general insights um, for people to be thinking about. Um, just reminding people as well on the call, please, that if you want to ask a question, feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to those at the end of the session. So, um, Kim, tell us about some of the, the, the data that you're looking at and what that's perhaps telling us. Yeah, well, it's not necessarily just data, but I'll sort of focus on some key themes. I guess the common perception out there is that Auckland's built this big sucking vortex that's taking a whole lot of people out of regional New Zealand and into Auckland. And if you actually have a look at the data, the trend's actually going the other way. You know, Auckland typically benefits from what's called external migration. And of course, with borders shut, well, external migration has basically gone to zero. Now, what have we seen in Auckland consistently for the past three years? Auckland loses people to what's called internal migration. Now, that's normally the flow of people up to Northland, Waikato, Bay of Plenty, yeah, that outer ring of Auckland has benefited for the past sort of three years. But I wonder about 2022, whether that sort of initial exodus is gonna turn a little bit more into a stampede and beyond Waikato, beyond the Bay of Plenty into other parts of New Zealand. And your housing or housing affordability is the number one concern across New Zealanders at the moment. So which regions are going to stack up in regard to where I think people are going to want to go? It's going to be places where they're going to get a decent lifestyle and they can put a reasonably priced roof over their head. And I'll talk about you know, down the track, but the Christchurch valuation-wise, in fact, you know, other parts of the South Island look an awful lot more attractive through valuation metrics than what we're seeing up around the Waikato, your Bay of Plenty, and particularly Auckland. But you know, the anecdotes you're seeing on the ground, we're seeing within the hard data. Okay, that's good. Thank you. That's that's good. I think an interesting measure too that that I don't know how you could put a number on, but is around the quality of houses. And I know the feedback that we often get from people coming down is not only is it cheaper to buy a house in Christchurch, but the standard is a lot higher. And I think people forget that there were ten thousand, might have been eleven thousand houses demolished after the earthquakes that tended to be the weaker quality houses that were impacted, and they've been replaced with brand new builds. So if there was a, a average quality measure across cities, I think that would that would stack, stack up pretty well also. Okay, so let's have a look at this next one. Ken, what, what's, what, what are these squiggles telling us? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll, I'll take people through this. Yeah, normally, people will look at yeah, one or two property indicators, typically prices. Now, in my mind, you've got to look at not just prices, you've got to look at days to sell, you've got to look at volume sold, you've got to have a look at the gap between the list versus the sale price. Now this indicator sort of breaks the property market down into four basic parts of the cycle. You've got the boom, and then after a boom, you typically go through what's called moderation, and then you get into a little bit of a decline, and then you start to rebuild, and you go in that counterclockwise fashion. Now it's been interesting to track Canterbury from late 2018. Now we fear 2016, 2017, the Canterbury market wasn't doing too much. It was massively underperforming what we're seeing across New Zealand. Now, Canterbury, like most other parts of New Zealand in 2020, you hit, hit the absolute uh, rocket fuel and you're off to the races. Now, if I have a look at the data up to September 2021, yeah, Canterbury pretty clearly is in the boom phase. You know, what we're seeing with the most parts of New Zealand at the moment is signs that, generally speaking, most regions are moving from boom towards moderation. We're starting to see things slow up a little bit. Uh, the exception out there across New Zealand, the moment, or one of the regions, we're, we're still seeing pretty consistent strength is actually coming through Canterbury. But that, that cycle indicator is just one that I track 
pretty well because you know, it's, it's pretty simple economics is you're going to go through you know, different quadrants and you've got to have a look at a whole range of different economic indicators to determine you know, where you are within that cycle. But the property market does cycle. Okay, good. Um, what about other parts of the country while we're talking about that, Kim? Are there any sort of hot spots where you would see greater risk or anywhere else that's looking um, a little bit similar to Canterbury at the moment? Yeah, if you look at pure valuations, you know, the likes of Taranaki uh, probably ticks with the best valuation box. If I have a look at where I'm increasingly worried about what is going to take place in the next 12 to 24 months, it's Auckland. You know, Auckland had a net population loss in the last 12 months and building consent issued around 20,000. Now, okay, Auckland's got a housing shortage at the moment, according to the official estimates, but if you're getting a population loss and you're potentially building 20,000 houses a year, now I know yeah, there's a bigger gap now between consent versus construction because you can't get the materials. Yeah, but eventually those houses are going to get erected. And I, I, yeah, the, I agree with the Reserve Bank that the whole fundamentals between supply and demand have turned around. Now, this, this does not mean that it's across the board in regard to what we're going to see across New Zealand. You know, building consents in the last 12 months, 46,000, 20,000 of them in Auckland. You know, so Auckland is taking an outsized share of new building activity at a time Auckland is one of the few regions across New Zealand to actually see a net population loss. And the other places across New Zealand that typically see a population loss are uh, places along the West Coast. It just doesn't happen very often. Okay, that's that's interesting. Um, great, thank you. And so interest rates on this slide. So talk us through your expectations over the next 12, 24 months on rates. Yeah, so if I have a look at market expectations for the official cash rate, your market expectations are the official cash rate is likely to go up around 2.5% uh, in two years' time. So if we sort of you know, scroll that into where the, the one-year fixed rate is likely to be two years out, you're talking a one-year fixed rate up around the 5%. Now, historically, 5% has been pretty low. Of course, if you sort of you know, gobble it up a one-year fixed rate at 2.2%, uh, five to six months ago, 5% uh, is going to be a long way away from 2.2%. Yeah, so interest rates would have that big springboard effect on the way down, yeah, but it is going to have a very constraining influence on the market over the coming you know, 12 and 24 months. I think from memory, there's about 60% of total loans are due to get refixed in the next 12 months. And we've already seen those fixed rates that are about 50% you know, off their lows. Yeah, so it's a fundamentally different story in regard to where borrowers are going to be facing higher interest rates. Yeah, you know, For the average borrower, is that going to be too much of a concern? I think the answer is no. Uh, debt servicing is still going to be low historically. Yeah, but if you've jumped in late in the cycle and you sort of filled your boots, you know, when an interest rate goes from, say, 2.2 to, to 4.5, yeah, it could be a bit of a wake up call. Yeah, yeah, good points. And uh, yeah, for what we're saying, I mean, and you know this, Cam, as well, that the banks have been always fairly conservative when they're assessing new mortgage loans. Um, you know, they work on an assessment rate of six or just over six yeah. percent have done for the last 12 months. So um, affordability shouldn't bite. But I agree, there's certainly some risk there and we're taking extra care with our customers at the moment when those rates are rolling over, that people don't take the lazy option and just go for the one year fix because it's the easy easy, easy option and it's the lowest rate. That could bite if rates go up by 2%. So obviously it depends on individual circumstances, but it's a, a time to be thinking a bit more strategically for the next couple of years on those rates. Um, if we an article out on business desk end of last year and said I was taking a five year rate and people asked me what on earth are you doing that? Yeah, you know, that rate yeah. was it was three. It was the most expensive in the market. Well, yeah, three at the moment looks pretty good for five years. Got four years left to run. Exactly, exactly. Um, I've just jumped into the uh, Q and A. Thanks. There's a few questions coming through there, so thanks for those. Um, there's a question here around: Are all the banks the same? Is it harder now to get finance? Which um, is a great question. Thank you to whoever asked that. Um, the banks are not the same. Um, there is quite a variance at the moment. Uh, there's probably a gap of, I would say, conservatively 50,000, can be up to $150,000 difference between the bank that will lend you the most and the least 
Um, they all have different algorithms as to how they calculate the costs of uh, children, cars, income brackets, and so on. So absolutely, banks are not all the same, and it's worth uh, getting some professional advice when you're starting to look at your options. Uh, we'll pick up some of those other questions shortly, but if we jump on to valuations, Cam, I know you've, you've got some good insights to share here um, across the country, please. Yeah, well, we just need to accept, like, we, we are in a different environment. You know, the, the Reserve Bank is not throwing around the term that you know, house prices are unsustainable at current levels for nothing. Does that mean house prices are going to drop? Well, the answer is not necessarily, and no one really knows. You know, given how economists sort of caught it in the last 12 months, it would be a pretty brave economist to be getting out there with a the hard, firm view over the next sort of 12 months. But, but what we do know is that interest rates are going to be moving up. There's a little bit of conjecture over how far, far. Yeah, so we need to be getting into a little bit more of the basics here in regard to yeah, the value, the markets that are off of better value, I think are going to be a little bit more enduring you know, over the next sort of two to three years. You know, so if I have a look at you know, Auckland, for instance, Auckland's got the combination really high valuation. So the median house price uh, is around 11 times the median household income, which is right up there. Now you've got Bay Plenty's getting pretty ex extended as well. Otago's up there. Why is Otago up there? Well, it's not the need. And it's obviously Central Otago. And, and it's pretty unique in regard to what's going on there. You know, Nelson's getting up there as well. Yeah, but if you look at Canterbury, for instance, or yeah, yeah Canterbury's trading in a multiple of around seven. You know, Southland's around five. And Southland's amongst the cheapest property in New Zealand. Yeah, incomes are actually pretty solid. But you know, the valuations are actually not that bad. Yeah, so I, buyers have just, I think, got to be pretty smart going forward and accept that the fundamentals across the market, supply and demand and interest rates are a big turnaround from what we've seen two to three years ago. Now, that does not mean we're entering a, a market where we're going to see difficulties, although I'm a little bit, you know, as I said, concerned about Auckland. But you've just got to play, play it a little bit smarter here. And a you know, big defence mechanism is that where you can extract better value, you know, you're going to have a lot better defensive position going forward as interest rates start to move up. Yeah, okay. And with, within Otago, just thinking about the South Island more specifically, there is obviously um, a difference there between, like you say, Central Otago and Dunedin. Where, where would they be looking at the moment? If you split that out further on this graph, where would Dunedin sit? Well, Dunedin would sit slightly above Canterbury which I always find a little bit ironic in regard to you know, why the need in property valuation-wise is, is higher than Christchurch. Because yeah, I've lived in both places and I, and I can tell you, I know, I know where the better lifestyle is. Now, people might have a different view over that, uh, but I, I, I think Christchurch has just got certain attributes, international airport, yeah, accessibility to a ski field, this sort of stuff. Okay, yeah, the name's got Central Otago, so it's got special characteristics as, as well, but I would have thought Christchurch would trade at a slight premium to the needed. It actually doesn't. It goes the other way around. And of course, you know, Queenstown, Wanaka is just fundamentally unique. And of course, you know, buying a property is not just about valuation. It's not just about interest rates. It's not just about migration. You know, we're seeing big behavioural shifts here in regard to what COVID is bringing to the table. You, know, you can't go overseas. You, know, you can't source that fancy car at the moment because the supply chain is getting thrown around. You know, so, so what do you do? Maybe you throw a bit of money to, to the kids so they can get on the property ladder, or maybe you go buy that special property down in Central Otago. You know, we've sort of got the bucket list is, is turned up on steroids. You know, suddenly lifestyle and appreciation of different things is driving big major shifts in, in behaviour. And of course, the, the more the property market has gone up, and added to wealth over the past yeah, 12 months. And there's been, yeah, by my, my calculations, I think this year, household balance sheets are up by about $500 billion, which is a reflection of equities. It's a reflection of, of the housing market. Now, even if the property market pulls back, households are still an incredibly lot wealthier, and that gives them options in retirement. It gives them options in regard to what they're going to be doing going forward. You know, so irrespective of interest rates moving up, there's still an awful lot of liquidity that is floating around New Zealand. Uh, thing to worry about in regard to that sort of makes me worry about where is inflation going to end up? 
because at the moment it's 4.9% and it's still accelerating. Yeah, yeah, no, good points. Well, I think the other interesting dynamic in there as well, Cam, is that historically that population shift that we're seeing come from Auckland and the, the North Island South has been uh, people resigning from their roles, their jobs, and picking up vacant roles in the South Island. Now, the labour market seems to be a lot more mobile and people are actually coming down with their jobs intact, which is a double win, if you like, for the South Island. It's probably double negative for the North Island too, I guess, but um, that's new new employment and new wage growth coming in as well as population. So, um, hey, we've got a question here I think would be a good one to, to ask you at the moment too. Um, is Mid and South Canterbury included in the Canterbury numbers? Any, any thoughts on those areas? Yes, and I've been looking at Timaru of late. Sorry, you've been looking at Timaru? I've been looking at Timaru of late as well. Yeah, in terms uh, of... And not just through a property lens, I'm thinking about Timaru as a region for horticulture in regard to its future over the next sort of 10 to 20 years. Yeah, okay. In terms of being attractive, yeah, well, I think if I have a look at, yeah, we, we, we're sort of obviously in New Zealand, we've reached peak cow, we've we've reached sort of peak pastoral traditional farming production. Yeah, we've got to find replacements for that growth we get at, used to get out of milking more cows. Yeah, horticulture, I think, across New Zealand has got some great potential. Yeah, so I'm looking at areas in New Zealand where I think horticulture is really going to get embedded going forward. And South Canterbury is one of those ones that I'm having a bit of a nosy at. And starting okay. to think about the downstream implications for that region as well. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on to the Q and A. There's a couple of questions here, and um, a couple for me and a couple for you, Kim. So um, I'll start off with a couple for myself. So uh, question here: Are you seeing friends, etc., as first home buyers combining forces to get on the ladder? Uh, does this impact the lending ability versus if trying to go alone? Uh, absolutely, we're seeing that happen. So within our loan market agile team. Um, it's actually getting bloody hard now, uh, excuse my language, for an uh, individual person on the average wage to afford a house and afford a mortgage. So it's becoming common for whether it's friends or siblings um, to join forces, doubles the deposit, uh, creates double income. Uh, the banks look at that slightly differently. Some banks are, are, are very favourable towards that scenario, some less so. Um, but yep, absolutely, that's an option for people and a great option to explore if you can't do it by yourself. So thank you for that question. Uh, another question here, when getting a mortgage, can you borrow extra for upgrades? What are the benefits for first home buyers in building new over buying older houses? Um, that's probably a question that's best taken offline. Uh, everyone's got a different view on that, but um, look, building new, uh, there's generally some capital gain there, not always. At the moment, there are some risks with new, uh, depending on which part of the country you're looking at. There's a lengthy wait for titles to come out. There's some upside risks with building costs, depending on what your contract looks like. Uh, so it's a bit of a horses for courses, that one, I think, depending on your situation. Um, can I, Rodney, can I, just, yep. can I just add something on that? Jump in. So, so if you have a look at, look, if you look at the thrust of government policy over the last 12 to 24 months, it's all been about stimulating new builds you know, at, at the expense of the existing stock including various interest deductibility aspects. You know, what people now also need to think about at the moment is the impact of inflation. You know, inflation is now making the cost of building somewhat prohibitive because it's pretty hard to make the numbers stack up. But what inflation always does is that if the replacement cost of the house has just gone up, then the value of the existing stock will go up as well. And so we quite often when we talk about the negative impact that potentially rising interest rates can have on the property market, Historically, it's been an offset to that, which is actually been inflationary pressure, and it tends to support the existing stock. Yeah, 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 fair point. Uh, next question here, how much does it cost to use a mortgage broker? Uh, it costs nothing to use the services of a mortgage broker. The bank pays the mortgage broker, and the bank's happy to do that because they're paying uh, that mortgage broker to do the work that they would otherwise be paying their own staff to do. Um, so free service, uh, you go through an app application process once and you get access to the full range um, of lending options. Um, so you can pick that best, best option for you. Um, so thank you for that question. And uh, last question, I think, uh, is one for you, Cam. Um, and this is a good one. And I, it's not from me, I promise you. Economists 
are not often right or have not often been right. How confident are you with your predictions? Oh, did I put too many predictions on the table? The, the problem was, yeah, people tend to view economists' predictions as in it's going to happen the next sort of three, six, 12 months. Whereas, you know, when we sort of express views, we tend to, well, this is my view, I, I tend to express it much within a long-term context. You know, so let's have a look at the moment in regard, let's say the property market. The property market historically in New Zealand has increased at 7.4% since 1991 every year on average. So, so it doubles every, every decade. If the New Zealand property market uh, continues at that rate, which some people get out there and say, then the ratio of house prices to the median wage in New Zealand is going to go from 11 to 15. Now, if you think we've got social blowback at the moment in regard to the property market, imagine what it could be in five to 10 years if the historical property market performance continues. Now, it might happen, but looking at the laws of economics and looking at the way society has been prodded at the moment, that would not be my central trajectory in regard to where things are actually going to take place. Yeah, so a lot of what you know, we tend to do, or I tend to do as an economist, is that you know, it's not sort of black and white here. It's starting to get people thinking about the balance of risks and making sure you're positioned for those balance of risks and fully informed. Yeah, great. Okay, and let's um, let's come back to the question and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. We're right on time. Um, so, Cam, and I think we'll both answer this and uh, let's see if we've got a similar answer. Um, should I wait? What's your answer to the question? Well, there's no one size fits all. You know, if someone's a seller, someone's a buyer on the other side. You know, if someone's an investor, you know, buying, well, someone's maybe exiting on the other side. So you, you, you kind of hope that there will be a, a reasonable transaction between the two. I guess the best way to answer that is, what am I doing myself? Myself, um, I'm still investing in a couple of regions around New Zealand. Uh, one of them is a very big project, and I've done a lot of due diligence on that to make sure the demand side is going to hold up. Uh, I'm staying away from Auckland for the next two years. At some stage, I'll look at Auckland, but it'll be from the buy side, but not at the moment. Okay, well, that's a very clear answer. Thank you. And uh, yeah, similar theme to me, I guess, answering that question, should I wait? Um, it comes down to your own circumstances, of course, right, and what you're trying to do. But I do think about the adage that everyone would be aware of for investing in the share market, where we've all been told from a very young age that it's not about timing the market, it's about time in the market and not trying to pick those peaks and troughs. Um, if you think you can pick a peak or a trough in the housing market, uh, let me know and give me some share tips as well, I think would be useful. I think we need to be taking a slightly longer term view around what our goals are when we're buying or selling property and then making the right decision. So um, the fundamentals are still strong for the property. I agree, Kim, totally with your comments that the you know recent um, changes and increases in house prices are just simply not sustainable and no one wants to see them carry on at those levels. Um, but people need to surround themselves with the right, the right professionals and take the right advice um, which is what we're here to do at Loan Market Agile. So if anyone would like any further advice, please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, Cam, I thank you for your time. I know you're a busy man and really appreciate your insights. Uh, we have got a recording of this session and we will send that out to all of the participants. So uh, without further ado, thank you very much for your time, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.